we are back here in this place after one year uh, since the first conference that the National Board of Biologists has organized at that time with the new management. And this conference was quite successful, though troubled, as we were blamed at the time of having gathered the past of anti-vaccinists. Therefore, we struggled to say that instead we had gathered maybe the past of those who could talk to us to show us the new breakthroughs and the new frontiers of biologists. So we hosted the Nobel Prize, Luc Montagnier. We listened to scientists coming from Russia, Denmark. We listened to the outstanding keynote speeches on the influence of electromagnetic fields, the so-called memory of water. We heard Professor Gatti showing us the issue of nanoparticles and therefore environmental pollution and to what extent these inhaled substances or these substances coming into contact with our body could produce severe pathologies. Today, instead, after one year, we are making a further step forward I'm announcing you that we are going to make another step forward next year, another event, as I've proposed to the board of the of our institution. And I would like to thank the board uh, for their solidarity, support, and determination with which they're following me. Also, in this adventurous research of mine in questionable fields or fields that are highly opposed by certain part of science. Because I believe that the issue of vaccines in Italy is not stopping. It is not ending until a third institution, I hope the judiciary, is going to order to the RIS or the branch of the Italian police dealing with forensic or Carabinieri NAS, the Food Law Enforcement Department, to go in a counter trend to verify the uh, screening analysis that Professor Bogan is going to show us today. Because if these tests are to be validated by those who have the juridical power to take the relevant measures, we'll find ourselves faced with the biggest fraud in, in trading that has ever occurred in Italy. Believe me, I'm not a scientist. And I'm still believing that what Enrico Fermi said is true. He said that scientists are those who discovered something. All the others are simply talking for hearsay. Therefore, I am not a scientist, but I do not recognize the dogmas of those who think to be the custodians of scientific truth. Nando Dornado was making me ponder on something, the word research right now. Semantically, from the semantic viewpoint, it means continuously searching. I didn't understand why research on vaccines instead is necessarily to be deprived of the further constant search and research and instead research is, to, is supposed to go back to Aristotle, to the Ipsa Dixit. It is supposed to go back to Newton and not to Einstein. I mean, we should nourish ourselves of a revealed truth by someone who is interested fairly enough to impose ourselves to be taken for our word. Because, you know, we can be deceptive and 
epistemology of science that Popper has taught to us, states that truth in scientific field is such only if it undergoes a failure test, meaning that if a certain test performed under the same conditions in another place is going to give different results compared to what a researcher states or says having ascertained in another circumstance. So it doesn't say you have to rely to custom because many keep on saying that vaccines are good because it, it had, they have been like this for a hundred years with a vaccine practice and if, if we survived thousands of people survived it means routinely as a paradigm that vaccines are good if this is the case i would be vaccinated once a month but fairly enough clearly enough it's not like this not because i hope that it should be like this instead i hope that by constantly searching and updating and researching on science, we can find out a message of quietness, but it has to be documented. And as we are asked to publish, Corvelve has been asked to publish the results of these tests according to a scientific procedure that is called peer review, it means publishing and these publications have been previously reviewed by third party scientists who have made the validation. It's good. I've never published Corveil tasks because I forged an agreement with Bolgan to publish these results once they have been already published on a scientific uh, paper because I represent a professional border and I cannot believe or give credit to some elements which did not follow the correct scientific practice and procedure. So this doesn't mean that this burden has to be placed and cast only on those who have certain doubts, only on those who research, and should not be placed also on those who keep on reassuring us because purposely, according to custom, they tell us that it has always been like this and it is good, uh, all is well, Madame Marquise, so to say. This is not scientific method. This is the method of peddlers, of those who are almanac sellers. And university titles are worthless. Science does not recognize other Anything else than the results of our research? Guglielmo Marconi was awarded the Nobel Prize, but he was never graduated in physics. Just a few people know this. You do not need a degree or a university faculty to provide important contributions to science and there is no lie we could transform a fallacy into truth just by stating that those who's making this statement is a professor. We are struggling for this, to tell this. So now I have to leave the floor to those who across the globe, in India, in America, in the US, in our Naples, with the Institute of oncology, they are studying and researching on vaccines according to the evidence-based method without prejudices and in a, detached, in a detached way. But something is for sure. We cannot get verbal reassurances. We have the right to ask to the Minister of Health of this nation, we have the right to ask to the president of the Italian Institute of Health, who has been politically appointed, and the president of the IFA, who has been politically appointed, to ask to the politics to show 
the analysis that allowed the marketing and the continued placing on the market of vaccines, this analysis have to be uh, shown. So the state is imposing on us the use of these drugs. And dear senator and colleague, the state has the duty to compensate all the adverse events because if this obligation was not there and this is a, a pondering that just a few people made if we were not forced to be vaccinated faced with an adverse event in the demonstration of a cause and effect relation the family in case of an adverse event in case of a judicial litigation, the family would turn against the producer of the drug. But as there is the obligation of vaccination, this goes against, turns against the state that has forced to that healthcare treatment. So we are faced with a paradox, the Italian paradox. We buy vaccines. We buy vaccines because the sellers tell us that they are safe. This is confirmed by those who receive the fundings by those who sell the vaccines. And if there is an adverse event, the payers are not those who confirmed the safety and the healthiness of the vaccine. Instead, it's the state that pays. Joe Muggins always pays. There are no public money, as, as uh, Margaret Thatcher said. There is no public money. It's the, just the money of the taxpayers which is us. So, so we are supposed to say here, silent, quiet, to say, yes, we trust science. What kind of science is it all about? Those who demonstrate that we are wrong in thinking negatively of vaccines. We are supposed to stay here, silent and complacent, to read on the newspapers that Bolgan is supposed to make the counter-analysis of their screenings because it's not us to us to demonstrate that Professor Bolgan was wrong, according to them. Those were supposed to demonstrate that she's wrong when there is already a law imposing to the state to verify to ascertain these outcomes and even more this state is so foolish that it's the producer of vaccines who is supposed to choose the target for the control. So this is an heresy, so to say. It's not the state that is supposed to choose. It's like asking to a diabetic patient to tell to this patient without testing the blood sugar, glycosuria or glycosylated hemoglobin that his or her health conditions are perfect because we have not ascertained or screened that kind of analysis. We simply made a test for rheumatism. So this is what happens for vaccines as well. So we want to see this analysis. We are in a state of low. I am not Joe Loke. I'm not the founder of liberalism, but uh, there's something I've learned. That in a state of law, morality relies in law. If the law imposes that on vaccinations, there have to be screenings before, during and after, those who do not follow this obligation is an immoral person, is a person that is infringing upon the ethical code and the criminal code as well. And we cannot accept the ethical judgment by those who are disguising fraud, those who are disguising this secrecy. And so this doesn't mean to place the biologists in the grounds of politics. It seems to state that biologists have the full freedom of, to doubt, the full freedom to research. They are fully free to listen to everything and everyone because peers means life, but logos means word in Greek. 
So a scientist who is not free to talk, to speak up, is an ignorant slave. So I would like my category, my profession that I'm honored to represent, is free to live this profession with no restrictions, with no gags, and with no limits. I would like to to show also for our friends uh, that I've met, I was honored to meet last night, except with the exception of Professor Manson that I'm meeting this morning for the first time. So I'd like to show a movie that we have seen already last year, the famous hearing of Gary Cooper. So by listening to this again after one year of worries, you see that it is no longer, you know, just a, a movie story. It's a, a case that is deeply rooted in our reality. We are outsiders. We are considered as the antagonists of the real science. But who is supposed to deliver this patent, um, this authorization to orthodoxy? Because I would have bought one of these authorizations. Maybe Professor Buror, you know, where to print this authorization to orthodoxy. Anyway, Gary Cooper, as you can see, he says this. It says science has no owners and cannot be subject, subjected to anyone. A scientist is uh, answering only to his own truth. The truth that the scientist is searching for is supposed to a certain scientific doubt or the scientific objective that the scientist wants to achieve. This truth cannot be subject to limitations or compromises. If a scientist is denied this, this scientist becomes a servant. He would become a dog on a leash of the political power that occupying the elf institutions wants to impose is its scientific truth. That's the truth. And you're going to see, uh, to watch also another movie that I've chosen of a French virologist who says something that if it was said in Italy, he would be crucified. Teresa on the Foglio newspaper would have derided him. He would be derided by Feltri, Travaglio, by all the metro the intellectual guides of the press and the TV anchorman. So what is this virologist, virologist saying? He is a consultant of the WHO and he works for Sanofi. So producer and consultant on vaccines. He says something very simple. In vaccines there are contaminants. It's difficult to avoid contamination. We do not have a patented formula to, to get uh, vaccines that work. So we, we act with trials. Then we market these vaccines. If they work, they work. If they do not work, we do not go back investing more money on this because we have to, to go to start again from scratch. So in these vaccines, there are adjuvants, preservatives, addictives, and wastes of production. So, uh, bear with me just a second. This is said by a virologist, a producer of vaccines. So, why in Italy those who say the same things and want to know from the qualitative and quantitative point of view what is the nature of these uh, preservatives, addictives, adjuvants, and wastes of productions is, is going to be an enemy of science. So why is it that Italy goes back to the Middle Ages? It goes back to Aristotle. Ipse dixit. It was said by this person and each dispute was over. But then Copernicus came, Galileo came. There was Newton's physics for two centuries and then Einstein came, a journalist uh, to whom I wrote on a newspaper that I read every morning that I was, you know, deeply disappointed. He said, Dear President, I have not found anything of what you are suspecting. 
on the website of the WHO. Well, I think that before that Einstein published his theories, these theories were not written anywhere by no one. So this person wants to find the results of a result beforehand on the website of the WHO and not finding anything in that website. This person thinks that anyone who doubts of vaccines is a bungler, a liar. Is this reasoning ground? And the newspaper goes on the best desks of people, the intelligentsia, the Italian culture, uh, the intellectual persons, the Adornato, can be reduced to this. Why? We are a people, we are quarrelsome as a people. We talk negatively and we doubt of any politician. Recently, we were assigned with politicians and it was a political tsunami that uh, overturned the political class. So why are we, are we so accommodating, so good, so naive on some drugs that we inject to children? What three months? have not even developed yet the immune system completely and so it is not completely efficient. So why do we accept all this? I'm not a slanderer, not a liar. But I think that maybe numismatics has something to do with all this. Because it cannot be explained in a different way. There are collectors of coins all around. This money, these coins are spent in the uh, political campaigns, the budgets of the parties are, are self-evident. There is not even a single party who has not received funds from the pharmaceutical industry. Find one of these parties. Kodakons has uh, shown the results in these days. Only Smith and Klein has paid in 2017 42 million of contributions to GPs, pediatricians of their own choice, researchers and university uh, professors. So, of course, we, Novartis and Alfim and Aridi did that. So, bear with me. We have poisoned the consciousness of Italy for pensions, for the wages of the members of the parliament, and it was good. So. That's the end of the story. But all about this, this money uh, that is being moved, moved around. Who is supposed to talk about this? The biologists, this is not our task. So what is our task? Is to talk about science. And those who want to gag us has not counted on our importance. Thank you.
ma la mente è un attributo dell'individuo, non c'è e non si può concepire una specie di cervello collettivo. L'uomo che pensa di dire da sé, come può lavorare se è sottoposto a costrizioni di ogni genere? È impossibile subordinarlo a bisogni, opinioni o desideri di altri. Nessuno ha il diritto di sacrificarlo. Chi crea si basa sul proprio giudizio. Il parassita segue l'opinione degli altri. Chi crea pensa, il parassita copia. Chi crea produce, il parassita ruba. Chi crea tende alla conquista della natura, il parassita alla conquista degli uomini. A chi crea va data indipendenza, egli non comanda e non serve nessuno. Fra lui e gli altri c'è un libero scambio, una libera scelta. Il parassita cerca il potere e tenta di livellare gli uomini in un'azione comune, una comune schiavitù. E pretende che l'uomo debba essere uno strumento ad uso degli altri. Debba pensare come pensano gli altri. Agire come gli altri. Che debba annullarsi in una servitù senza gioia. Guardate la storia. Ogni conquista, ogni bene che possediamo deriva dall'opera indipendente di una mente indipendente. Ogni barbarie o decadenza nasce dal tentativo di fare degli uomini automi senza anima, senza cervello, senza diritti personali, volontà, speranza, dignità. È un antico conflitto. Oggi ha un altro nome, l'individuale contro il collettivo. Il nostro paese, che è fra i più nobili della storia degli uomini, si fondò sul principio dell'individualismo, ossia dei diritti inalienabili dell'uomo. Era un paese dove l'uomo era libero di cercare la sua felicità, di guadagnare e produrre non angustiato dalla rinunzia, di prosperare, non di lacrime, libero di possedere un bene inestimabile, il senso del suo valore personale e la più alta delle virtù, il suo amor proprio. Questo è ciò che i collettivisti vi chiedono di distruggere, come già altrove è stato distrutto. Quali sono gli elementi essenziali in una dose di vaccino? Da una parte abbiamo i batteri che servono a produrre la base virale, poi ci sono i virus e una peculiarità importante dei virus è la loro provenienza dalle cellule eucariote, perché i vaccini sono prodotti in colture di cellule. Bisogna capire che dentro ai vaccini virali c'è della materia viva. Dunque, questo supporto biologico che serve per coltivare il virus può essere una sorta di pericolo per il futuro vaccino. Per esempio, il siero vaccino bisogna che sia verificato molto bene perché c'è il rischio che possa introdurre dei virus come il BSE, morbo della mucca pazza, nei vaccini, perché è vivo. Questo esplica l'enorme controllo di qualità che si fa partendo dalla materia prima fino al prodotto finale, il vaccino. Poiché nel corso di tutto questo processo di produzione si lavora con la materia viva, c'è sempre il rischio di contaminazione con qualche agente contaminante anche per la negligenza dei tecnici. Questo è un aspetto che mi ha colpito molto quando sono passato dalla ricerca medica al mondo dei vaccini. C'è da dire che il rischio potenziale che ci sia un problema univoco nei vaccini non è avere delle reazioni avverse, queste le conosciamo, ma gli stupidi incidenti di percorso nei quali si introducono altri virus nel vaccino finale. Abbiamo il dramma degli anni 60, quando le cellule dei reni delle scimmie erano contaminate col virus SV40, un virus tumorigeno che provoca il cancro nelle cavie e abbiamo scoperto soltanto dopo che questo virus aveva contaminato i vaccini per i bambini. 60 milioni di americani hanno ricevuto questo vaccino tumorigeno e per fortuna questo virus non si è adattato all'uomo. È stato fermato con un decreto e da allora c'è tra i fabbricanti di vaccini questa ossessione permanente che una catastrofe simile non si ripeta più. È già successo, succederà ancora? Gli agenti contaminanti sono onnipresenti. Recentemente si è scoperto che il vaccino rotavirus prodotto dalla GSK era contaminato con un circovirus di origine suina. Per fortuna, ancora una volta, questo circovirus non era patogeno per l'uomo. Era stata apportata nel vaccino all'occorrenza della tripsina, dunque vediamo che nel settore dei vaccini non si parla soltanto di principio attivo. Quando dici vaccino per il morbillo, ovviamente il virus del morbillo è importante. 
ma bisogna pensare a tutto quello che comprende la materia prima, il siero vaccino che serve alla produzione, la tripsina che serve a far scindere le cellule o ancora la cellula di origine aviaria che essa stessa può portare qualcosa di imprevisto. Abbiamo avuto il caso del vaccino per la febbre gialla che è stato contaminato con il virus dell'aviaria. È stato un dramma, però di nuovo abbiamo avuto fortuna perché 400 milioni di persone sono state contaminate con questo virus vivo che si è moltiplicato nel loro organismo, ma il virus, per fortuna, non era patogeno per l'uomo. Vedete che nel settore degli incidenti post-vaccinali ci sono delle visioni tutte differenti nella scena industriale per quanto riguarda l'associazione con delle malattie misteriose come l'autismo, la sclerosi a placche, eccetera. Cose che preoccupano. L'industriale pensa che la cosa preoccupante sia il rischio di avere degli incidenti a causa dell'apporto di materie prime contaminate nel vaccino. Credo che possiate vedere bene il problema che preoccupa l'industria. Andiamo avanti. Parliamo delle cellule eteroploidie che hanno costituito una fase essenziale ma sollevano ancora un numero enorme di domande. Per esempio la cellula MDSK che viene utilizzata nella produzione del vaccino contro l'influenza è un eccellente supporto di produzione del vaccino ma è tumorigena. Il grande dibattito filosofico che si è aperto dice questo. Possiamo o no usare queste cellule tumorigene per fabbricare vaccini destinati ai bambini? Voglio dirvi che a livello delle autorità c'è un'enorme discussione, lo stesso tra i fabbricanti. Alcuni dicono che la quantità di informazione genetica del DNA è estremamente ridotta, quindi senza rischio. Altri dicono sì, ma attenzione, vacciniamo i bambini da 1 a 5 anni, però fra 50 anni quali saranno le conseguenze? Dunque, davanti all'accettazione di una cellula del genere, il dibattito resta aperto. Il dibattito resta molto elevato anche a livello della Food and Drug Administration perché questo argomento moralmente è un problema molto importante, tipo quando vacciniamo una persona di 75 anni non c'è nessun rischio, ma quando vacciniamo i bambini bisogna porsi delle domande sull'andamento a lungo termine. Beh, non voglio dire che voglio eliminare tramite vaccinazione le persone dai 75 anni in poi. La fase successiva è l'inattivazione del virus. Ritorno al concetto di partenza, cioè non sono importanti i ceppi virali vivi non attenuati come il morbillo, la rosolia, gli orecchioni eccetera, che conoscete già bene, ma i virus inattivati. Nel processo di produzione una fase essenziale, cruciale, è l'inattivazione. Vi racconto un altro aneddoto, però tanto aneddoto non è. Nel 1955 è stato realizzato il primo vaccino per la polio da Jonas Salk, conoscete tutti il vaccino IPB, è stato il primo vaccino realizzato su coltura di cellule dai reni di scimmia. È stata una storia straordinaria, sapete che il giorno in cui Jonas Salk ha annunciato questo successo hanno suonato tutte le campane in America, l'entusiasmo ha superato quello della fine della guerra. Dunque questo vaccino così importante, un vaccino prodotto nei laboratori Cater, Malgrado tutto l'entusiasmo che si era guadagnato, era stato inattivato male, non abbastanza, e ha contaminato più di 200 bambini con la poliomielite, tra i quali ci sono stati numerosi decessi. Vaccini inattivati male? L'azienda Cater sparisce. Se domani un vaccino antirabbico viene inattivato male, la Sanofi è finita, sparisce. Questi rischi ci saranno sempre, anzi, posso dire che è già successo con l'antirabbico. In Brasile molte decine di persone sono morte per l'infezione di rabbia dal vaccino. Allora, un po' di storia vaccinale legata alla febbre gialla. Un caso celebre si è prodotto durante la guerra, quando l'esercito americano ha deciso di vaccinare tutti i soldati che partivano per il fronte. Lo stesso hanno fatto gli inglesi, i francesi. Dunque sono stati tutti vaccinati e purtroppo c'è stata un'epidemia drammatica di epatite B. 28.000 casi di epatite B in seguito alla vaccinazione contro la febbre gialla. Era incredibile vedere sottomarini pieni di epatite B. Molti casi gravi sono stati segnalati solo parzialmente e non prontamente e tra i giovani militari vaccinati c'era anche una personalità influente all'epoca, Winston Churchill. Lui è stato vaccinato e contaminato con l'epatite B. Il suo biografo disse che il fegato era così distrutto che è stato un miracolo che questo non abbia fatto cambiare le sorti della guerra. Ecco come la vaccinazione può avere delle conseguenze sull'avvenire del mondo. Adesso, rapidamente, per finire voglio dirvi 
Come fare un vaccino? Sapete cos'è molto interessante? Ve lo dico, non lo sappiamo. Voi che filmate, manderete in onda alla televisione? Almeno scoprono tutti quanto sono fuori, no? Bene, come fare un vaccino? Allora, il punto interessante è che non esiste una ricetta. Ogni volta che appare un nuovo virus abbiamo il problema di come sviluppare il vaccino. Il migliore esempio è l'HIV. Quando è apparso l'HIV, Robert Gallo e il suo team americano hanno detto che, una volta isolato il virus, in due anni avremmo avuto un vaccino senza troppi problemi. Loro credevano di poter coltivare il virus e basta, ma 30 anni dopo il vaccino non c'è. Quello che è così interessante è che non esiste la soluzione miracolosa per produrre un vaccino. Nessuno sa veramente come fare. Storicamente, se un vaccino è andato male dall'inizio, non c'è modo di farlo andare bene in seguito. Ecco per esempio il vaccino contro la malaria. Sono passati X anni. O il primo vaccino anti-herpes prodotto negli anni 60, che è andato male, per non parlare della sifilide. Per concludere, se andiamo male già in partenza con un vaccino, è estremamente difficile recuperare in seguito. La cosa interessante avviene quando i vaccini generalmente vanno bene al primo colpo, come l'epatite B. Questo è un caso straordinario, un piccolo frammento di una proteina che protegge un organo come il fegato. È straordinario. Ebbene, il vaccino per l'epatite B è andato bene al primo colpo ed è andato molto facilmente. Dunque, quello che sorprende nella storia dei vaccini è che generalmente al lancio di una campagna di vaccinazione la cosa, se funziona, funziona alla grande, come l'epatite B o A. Quando non funziona però è veramente dura, perché penso che uno dei motivi essenziali della storia dei vaccini è che non capiamo come funzionano i vaccini, semplicemente perché una volta che il vaccino viene immesso sul mercato nessuno è più interessato al suo andamento, quindi oggi quando appare un virus nuovo non sappiamo come e se i vecchi vaccini abbiano funzionato per poterci ispirare e creare un altro vaccino. Io penso che per fare dei progressi nel settore delle vaccinazioni e dei nuovi vaccini bisogna studiare per bene la risposta immunitaria perché questa storiella ho un virus lo inattivo faccio un vaccino vedete anche voi se va bene va bene se no siamo bloccati con l'HIV non sappiamo cosa fare perché ci troviamo in una situazione inedita sarebbe a dire la protezione dell'immunità mucosale ma nessuno è riuscito a fare un vaccino con la protezione mucosale che sia contro la sifilide o il monococco non siamo mai protetti perché semplicemente il carro va davanti ai buoi, come si direbbe. Quindi non sappiamo come funzionano i vaccini e per ogni vaccino cerchiamo soluzioni. So what we have just heard is nothing brand new. It's already published on YouTube uh, for some years now, but I wanted to show it to you because I'm not a person who feels down easily or suffers from loneliness. Nevertheless, many times you, you know, you doubt, you wonder if you are a fool, if you are a person who is not capable of understanding what outstanding academics try to tell in a plain, simple way. I think that this person in Italy would never be invited to the Porta Porta TV show, would never be interviewed by Il Foglio newspaper by Giuliano Ferrara or other newspapers as well. Despite that, this person is working on vaccines and told us three things. With vaccines, we do not have a, a recipe. So what are the complications and contaminations implied by vaccines? We do not know anything about this. We have to study this. We have to perform screenings and tests. Third, when the vaccine doesn't work, it doesn't work. If it works, it works. So faced with this empirism, with this sort of alchemy spot in which we throw a whole set of things to then ascertain whether they work or not without a dividing line, a distinction, without a scientific truth, a fixed and immovable truth. We are supposed to believe, because this is the way some of our politicians would like or scientists would like, we're supposed to believe that vaccines are good, healthy, safe, 
because for a hundred years now, things have been done in this way. Attempts have been done, tests, trials, and counter trials to see if empirically it works. Of course, science is based on practical evidence, and we are supposed to tackle all these doubts and questions looming if a, the, only because the law is forcing us to vaccinate our children or grandchildren. If there is someone listening to me who is capable of demonstrating that this paradigm is rational as an ethical meaning or a practical meaning, regardless of the scientific value, then please, I would like to invite this person to tell me, to demonstrate these things, and I will buy the page on a newspaper, and I will have myself photographed wearing on my head the hat of a donkey. But if this is not true, as it cannot be true, because we are still missing the rationality, the logics of this paradigm, well then, you know, all men have a beard, Socrates has a beard, Socrates is a man. But all men have beard, Socrates has a beard, doesn't mean anything at all. I mean, we need a connection, a rational connection. Now we are going, we are about to leave the floor to Professor Bolgan, who, is, who as you can see, has a delicate iron constitution, so to say. She, like all persons coming from Veneto, the north of Italy, is a tenacious person, a talented person, but most of all, as Giulio Taro, or Professor Giuliano, allow me for this digression, she's mild, they have mildness. Because remember that tolerance is a cultural asset. Persons who are cultured are mild, open to confrontation, and do not have the presumption to impose their own version of the truth to anyone at all. There is a person speaking in the, in the audience. No, please, you cannot talk. Bear with me. At the end, there will be the Q&A session, the debate. If you leave the room, you can. This is not an happening. You are invited to leave the room. You cannot talk. Speakers can talk at this Congress. Please, bear with me. You can leave the room. You can leave the room, please. Bear with me. Leave the room. Please, organize a conference and do invite us. Organize a conference and invite us, please. Please, you can go away. Go out, please. You can go. So, as I was saying, as you can see, precisely this case, those who have culture of tolerant, those who think they can be the custodians of truth, behave such like this person. Anyway, I would like to, to say something to the representatives of the associations that are here present today. You can say that these persons are the main enemies. These loose canons who think they are the custodian of the truth you know, there are those who think you can talk about interplanetary conspiracy and instead these are just loonies that have to be cast aside because we are going to win this battle. We can win with temperance, with cultural temperance, with scientific truth. Everything that is outside of these canons is endangering our movement because it's like as if you are wearing the habit of those who want to be scientists just because they have learned something on Facebook. It doesn't work like this. It doesn't work like this and this is going to be demonstrated by Professor Bolgan who yesterday held a conference at the Chamber of Deputies and this morning at the press review talked about everything except for the results of these tests. 
So they're on the press, they talked about split in the five star political party. The fact that FICO did not prevent, inhibit the press conference. There were a whole set of considerations that had nothing to do with the results of the analysis of Professor Bolgan, what she said about these exams that had been produced. Another thing that we were told in these weeks that is that these exams are not certified. Instead, it's not true. They are certified, and we're going to show you the certificates. So who are these uh, imaginary labs? These are qualified labs instead that are recognized as such. So let us wait for the publication. As soon as these results are published, uh, well, I can tell you, announce that we will go to the three public prosecutors of Milan, Rome and Naples, and maybe also Palermo in Sicily, and I will show them the uh, these results, these exams, and I will uh, make a reporting for fraud in commerce and non-action submissions of the Office of the Minister of the, and the Director of IFA and the Director of the Italian Institute of Health. And this is not a threat. I will do this notification. Because if hundreds of people have self-taxed themselves, and I among, I'm among these people, to demonstrate that in vaccines there are a whole set of substances that are not supposed to be included, certified by fully equipped labs, these persons have the duty, and I'm saying this for the fifth time, to show the validating analysis, the procedures, of the marketing of the drug and vaccine and the continued placement on the market of this vaccine. If this does not happen, it's like as if the NAS would tolerate that on the fridge of a supermarket there would be foodstuff without the expiry date, without the indication of the content. Because today if you buy a yogurt, you're even told the name of the cow who pasteurized milk where it was brought, this milk was brought to produce yogurt and what is contained in the yogurt and what is not contained, uh, preservatives, additives, uh, coloring agents and whatsoever. He was talking about the vaccine that we inject in a three-month-old or four-month-old child and we have less guaranteed guarantees than a yogurt or a cheese. If we think that this is what we are supposed to claim to our politicians or the health institutions in charge to govern and oversee our health, well, I believe that this is not conceivable, possible at all. To draw my conclusions, I believe that next year we're going to meet once again with a new law, an amended law on the obligation of vaccination, because not all children are the same. We need at least a medical history, a family history. There are pre-vaccine examinations and screenings that have to be performed on, in the case of these children and paid by the public health system on public labs because I have a little lab and it was said that I had this uh, thesis due to personal interest. This is not the case. The state has imposed an obligation. The state is supposed to control and perform all the analysis that are needed. So in a, the uh, not the accredited labs. So next year we will find a new law and I hope that in the national prisons some scrounders are going to be imprisoned. Thank you.